good af a very good afternoon to all so i from on behalf of nnf uh, odisha team welcome you all to this webinar so today my topic of discussion is triaging of sick newborn uh, and i am currently working as assistant professor in aims bhuvneshwar so my objective of presentation is uh, triaging of newborn at admission to healthcare facility and manage of a newborn in tabcd format which is uh, temp t for temperature a for airway b for breathing c for circulation convulsion and shock and if the child is having di diarrhea neonate is having diarrhea then i have to watch for the features of dehydration so the word triage uh, comes from sorting what the triage means sorting so it is a process of rapidly screening sick neonates when they arrive at the hospital and then categorize them into one of the following groups like emergency which need emer acute emergency treatment then priority cases which need assessment subsequently rapid treatment and then non emergent case which need just assessment so there are different types of triaging system which is available throughout world in neonates and children the most two, two most commonly used systems are etart system which is actually three level triaging system which i already told you in the previous emergency priority and non emergent cases so this is three level triaging system which is known as etart or emergency triage assessment and treatment system another one is also available i am not going to detail in discussion that is known as five level uh, assessment or triaging system in this etart system which is most commonly used in neonatal triaging and it has been validated in law research limited setting in snc use of madhya pradesh so why triaging is important as we see all our emergencies are most of the times overcrowded then it is it becomes difficult to sort them out which are actually emergency cases which require immediate attention and which of them are little less serious cases which can be managed a uh, little later so this point the process of triaging actually involves assessing them assessing all patients at the triaging point and categ then categorize them into emergency priority cases or non emergency cases and subsequently initiate rapid treatment so gen triaging usually helps it is a quick systematic assessment of all children or all newborns admitted in the emergency room and so that sicker babies will get attention fast as compared to the non sicker ones and it also helps us in timely referring to higher center and in resource limited setting where there is always a limited shortage of stock it can help us in rationalizing the allocation of limited resources so uh, as i told you there are three various types of uh, triaging system one is etart another was one other one is five level assessment so uh, what i am i will be henceforth describing is describing is etart process in that there is in the assessment of a sick newborn as for the etart system there are five components a a b c c d okay so uh, they are known as pentagon of assessment so a for airway in which we have to at the time of admission we have to see whether airway is open uh, or closed whether there is some obstruction is there any added sounds gurgling stridors in breathing we have to see what is the respiration rate how are the efforts whether it is um, it is exaggerated efforts or it is uh, just swallow breathing and then we have to auscultate also in auscultation we have to find out whether there is a in auscultation we have to find out whether there is any added uh, uh, added sounds or it is only noisy breathing in added sounds we have to see crepitation wheezing ronchi all those is there in sinuses we have to see whether there is only bluish discoloration and if it, there is bluish discoloration whether the sinuses is present in the periphery like uh, tip of the tip of the fingers or it is central sinuses where generally we see for central sinuses is the mucosa membrane oral mucosa membrane then uh, nowadays spo2 is regarded as the sixth vital in neonates so spo2 recording is for a sick newborn is must at the point of assessment in emergency care so we have to attach the spo2 probe and wait till the re regular rhythm comes for couple of seconds then check the reading so as for uh, our uh, all neonates should have saturation more than 91% uh, 
and if there uh, and and if there is less than 91% we have to start supplementary oxygen then we have to see in c we have to check circulation for circulation heart rate has to be calculated normal neonatal heart rate is 110 to 150 160 per minute and uh, any heart rate more than uh, 160 is tachycardia similarly any heart rate less than 100 is known as bradycardia cft i will be showing in my skill video how cft is calculated capillary refilling time which is usually less than 2 seconds for neonates uh, more than 3 seconds we take is as uh, prolonged cft and it indicates uh, there is some circulatory abnormalities or it is in shock and all peripheral pulses uh, all newborns Uh, we have to whenever they are arriving at the casualty we have to check for the central pulses as well as peripheral pulses sometimes that also indicates shock and temperature is also another important vital parameter i would say it is more important but it is an important vital parameter in neonates as compared to other other age group because neonates are very prone to hypothermia so we have to take temperature in a digital thermometer nowadays nobody is using mercury thermometer because of uh, it is very cumbersome it takes longer time and there is chance of breakage and also there is always a chance of having mercury poisoning so we have to put the digital th thermometer in the axilla of the newborn and parallel to the chest wall and take and check the temperature till there is a beeping sound comes and whatever temperature is coming in centigrade we have to note it down and uh, usually newborn temperature is regarded you must have all uh, all been aware of temperature is uh, temperature is divided as normal temperature which is 36.5 to 37.5 degree centigrade then mild high uh, cold stress is known as 36 to 36.5 degree centigrade moderate hypothermia is 32 to 36 degree centigrade and any temperature less than 32 degree is always known as severe hypothermia and then it requires emergency management and in coma we have to see um, avpu that is alert response to voice pain and on responsiveness any features of convulsion but uh, unfortunately frank seizures like episode in neonate is very rare but if but being a pediatrician it is our job to uh, recognize even the subtle seizures which is more common in neonates in form of paddling twitching of eye eyelids orolingual smacking and uh, all, all these movements or uh, sometimes unexplained tachycardia is also a features of seizure neonatal seizure which is known as subtle seizure and rarely neonate can have uh, tonic seizures per uh, unilateral tonic seizure or clonic seizures but bilateral generalized tonic clonic seizures are very rare in neonates obviously for we have to all new, newborns admitted in the pediatric emergency we have to look for the pupillary signs like dilated pupils or pinpoint pupils and blood glucose is also an important parameter to rule out hypothermia especially whenever a child is comatose having convulsion or any abnormal altered sensorium we have to rule out hypoglycemia for there are several cut off values for uh, hypoglycemia in the whole blood what we do point of care uh, blood glucose monitoring in the whole blood by uh, pricking in the heel that blood glucose value there are a lot of cut off uh, like uh, aims protocol of neonatology says it is 40 mg per deciliter and then uh, who protocol says it is 45 mg per deciliter for our working purpose uh, any value less than 45 mg per deciliter in a newborn man is a hypoglycemia and it uh, it is an emergency sign and it mandates urgent interaction urgent intervention the last pentagon of assessment in a sick neonate is dehydration so we have to find a, any child who is having who is coming with complaint of decreased urine output lethargy and not passing urine there is history of poor feeding mother's milk output is not adequate uh, then we have to see features of dehydration in form of depressed fontanelli Uh, decrease sensorium uh, delayed skin pinch prolonged cft or tachycardia so uh, so this is an example which uh, this uh, triaging system i have taken from pgim or chandigarh so how the triaging system is, uh, we can prepare our own triaging card uh, at the time of emergency uh, at the for use in the emergency 
so you can see how the it is attached it is usually attached in each newborn case sheet so we have to at the end of this triaging all i have already told airway breathing circulation co then coma uh, dehydration and at the end of it we have to give a final physiological criteria categorization whether it is stable whether there is respiratory distress failure child is in shock coma convulsion or in cardiopulmonary arrest depending on the uh, categorization we have to finally level triage classify as emergency priority emergency signs are usually known as red signs then some of them are known as priority signs and some of them are known as non priority or less urgent which are otherwise known as green signs so uh, miss aboli can you please play this danger signs video for all our audience sure ma'am in this webinar i will discuss danger signs in the newborn it is well known that newborns are more likely to become sick compared to older children or adults there is also rapid progression of disease process in newborns which can result in death or disability therefore recognition of danger signs is important in newborns to help identify a serious illness to prioritize care and to improve outcomes the learning objectives of this webinar are to know common danger signs in newborns and to learn how to recognize them the signs which are most useful in identifying a sick newborn are stopped feeding well history of convulsions fast breathing severe chest pain drawing no spontaneous body movement low or high body temperature and pathological jaundice a sick newborn may have one or more of these signs every newborn should be assessed for danger signs during each postnatal care contact or when a newborn is brought to a health facility stopped feeding bell is an important danger sign in a newborn a healthy newborn should take breastfeeds regularly without any difficulty refusal to feed indicates a serious illness such as sepsis hypoglycemia or hypothermia the feeding status of the baby can be assessed by observing baby while being breastfed and see how well a baby is positioned and attached to breast and how he or she sucks a sick newborn sucks poorly or not at all convulsions are common in newborns so there may be history of abnormal body movements or you may be able to observe abnormal body movements in the form of twitching of hands and feet there can be repetitive blinking eye deviation or staring look some newborns can present with persistent chewing sucking or purposeless movement of limbs in the form of cycling movements there may be tonic posturing of one or more limbs you need to differentiate convulsions from jitteriness in newborns jitteriness is characterized by tremulous movements of limbs and these tremulous movements can be easily stopped by holding the limb fast breathing and severe chest pain drawing indicate respiratory distress in a newborn fast breathing is characterized by a respiratory rate of 60 or more per minute both fast breathing and severe chest pain drawing are common presentation of neonatal illness they may be caused by sepsis respiratory distress syndrome meconium aspiration syndrome and transient tachypnea of newborn so how do you recognize fast breathing and severe chest pain drawing for fast breathing you need to count respiratory rate for one full minute in a non crying baby as already mentioned a respiratory rate of 60 or more per minute constitutes fast breathing severe chest pain drawing can be assessed by observing definite inward movement of chest with each breath no spontaneous movement is an important danger sign in a newborn a healthy newborn shows normal spontaneous body movements while awake lack of spontaneous movement is a sign of illness it may be caused by sepsis hypoglycemia hypothermia or any other serious illness you need to observe baby for spontaneous body movements before touching him or her you should also note the response of the baby to handling or tactile stimulation low or high body temperature are common in newborn and indicate a serious illness such as infection hypothermia continues to be a silent killer of newborns because it is often undocumented and also remains untreated so how do we record temperature of a newborn baby there are different methods digital thermometer is the most commonly employed method 
the thermometer is placed in the axilla, you must record and document temperature of every newborn baby who is brought to a healthcare facility. Human touch can be used to assess the temperature of the baby. You need to touch the abdominal baby by the dorsum of your clean hand. Depending upon the temperature of the baby, baby will feel cold to touch or hot to touch. The temperature probe of a radiant heat warmer can also be used to record the temperature of the newborn baby. This displays continuously the skin temperature of baby. Jaundice is common in newborn babies. In most cases, it is physiological in nature and requires no treatment. However, jaundice is pathological if it appears in the first 24 hours of age or if it manifests as yellow staining of palms and soles. For jaundice, baby should be examined in a well-lit room. You need to press the skin gently to see yellow discoloration. However, visual assessment of skin color is not very reliable, especially in a baby who is receiving phototherapy. Therefore, always obtain serum bilirubin levels from laboratory in pathological jaundice. The key messages of this webinar are assess every newborn for danger signs at each healthcare contact. Rapid assessment and timely intervention are essential to improve outcome in sick newborns. Healthcare workers should be trained to recognize danger signs. And we should also educate parents to recognize danger signs and motivate them to seek healthcare early. Thank you. Okay. So in this webinar, we could see what are the common danger signs here. Uh, okay. So uh, with this, I will know uh, already we have told all signs, uh, danger signs uh, can be classified as emergency signs, which is usually hypothermia of temperature less than 36 degree, apnea or gasping, severe respiratory distress, sir has already mentioned in that webinar, Dr. Ashok, uh, rate is more than 70 per minute, severe chest in drawing or audible grunting, then presence of central cyanosis, shock, coma or convulsion. These are all emergency signs. And then coming to priority signs, any baby uh, with birth weight of less than 1800 grams, a child a neonate having cold stress, 36.4 to 36 degrees centigrade, with res uh, or respiratory distress with rates of more than 60, but no retractions or no grunting, neonate having refusal to feed, irritability, lethargy, significant abdominal distension, severe jaundice involving palms and soles, bleeding from any site or any major congenital malformations. They all constitute priority signs. And in non-priority signs, which is very common in day-to-day -day practice, is jaundice, any degree of jaundice not involving palms and soles, passing small amount of small volume stools daily, which is known as transitional stools or change in color of the stool, and lot of developmental peculiarities like uh, milia, uh, erythema toxicum, uh, mongoloid spots, uh, Epstein pearl. These are all developmental peculiarities. They are also non-priority signs. And sometimes minor birth trauma, forcep mark, or there is conjunctival hemorrhage. These are all minor birth trauma. Positing, positing is passing small volume of vomiting after feed. Cuddy, uh, milky participants, particles. And some superficial infections, which are uh, like uh, your uh, small postular lesions, neon neonatal postulosis, and any minor malformations like uh, extra ductile, polydactyly, or you are having a cutaneous tag in the uh, ear. These are all minor malformations. And any cases that is uh, not criteria categorized in priority. Uh, in prior uh, into either emergency or priority sign also will come under non-priority signs. So our management is like any presence of any of the emergency signs, we, we have to immediately stabilize the child after assessment, take immediate action, and then admit after stabilization, we have to admit in essence use. If a newborn has uh, any of the priority signs, then it, the newborn has to be assessed in detail by the treating physician at the healthcare contact facility. Then after assessment, if the physician or the healthcare worker feels there is requirement for admission, then he can be admitted to SNCU or similar facilities. And in presence of non-urgent signs, the newborn's parents or caregivers can well be 
found cells that it is not uh, of major issue and the case can be well managed uh, uh, at home with proper assessment and counseling so how the triaging is done and where it is done generally most of the time triaging happens at the reception area or casualty of a hospital and anybody can uh, whoever is trained for doing triaging is uh, he can do it he can be a healthcare worker in form of a pharmacist or nursing officer or uh, uh, doctors so in assessment uh, temperature airway that is uh, air temperature airway breathing circulation convulsion all this part has to be taken care of and uh, if you come to management uh, already i have shown triaging pentagon ne next i will target one of the one by one the problems so in temperature we can have problems of emergency sign moderate to severe hypothermia so for which we have to do rewarming re preferably under radiant warmer any moderate to severe hypothermia ideally has to be warmed under radiant warmer if it is not there then we have to at least give a trial to warm under skin to skin contact but after 15 minutes we have to assess and if still the child's temperature is not improving then we have to rewarm under radiant warmer and after rewarming uh, with re radiant warmer also if the temperature is not improving then we have to treat like a case of severe hypothermia and we have to rule out sepsis we have to start oxygen give vitamin k antibiotic iv fluid and uh, we have to refer it to higher cases and only if the child is having borderline hypothermia which is known as cold stress then we can just check temperature of the surrounding Uh, we should ensure adequate clothing initiate skin to skin contact if it is low birth weight baby skin to skin contact and kmc and breastfeeding will definitely improve the temperature of the child and after 1 hour here we have to improve, repeat the temperature and still if the temperature is not improving then we have to manage as a case of moderate to severe hypothermia uh, now i would like to request uh, aboli to uh, to show a webinar on how to do temperature measurement in a newborn baby sure oh, ma'am In this video we will learn how to check the temperature of a baby using a digital thermometer After cleaning the thermometer we will switch it on The metal tip of the thermometer should be applied to the middle of the armpit that is the apex of the axilla We gently hold the arm of the baby by the side of the baby's body Most digital thermometers will beep to indicate that reading is complete Now remove the thermometer and note down the reading. Clean the thermometer before putting it away. okay second video on the use of radiant warmer i have already told if the temperature is not improving after initial measure like skin to skin contact uh, initiating breastfeeding and kangaroo mother care then we have to take we have to use a radiant warmer for starting rewarming okay please play the video of a radiant warmer use yes ma'am In this video we will learn how to use a radiant warmer. First we'll start with cleaning the radiant warmer. If the radiant warmer is not occupied it can be cleaned with locally available disinfectant solutions like 2% glutaraldehyde. Use a cloth dampened with soap water for daily cleaning 
when the neonate is being cared for in the warmer. The control panel allows us to regulate how the baby is kept warm. This display shows you the baby's temperature as measured by the temperature probe attached to the baby. As you can see, there are two available modes in the radiant warmer. In the manual mode, we can set the heater output anywhere between 0% and 100%. We use this mode to preheat the warmer before the baby is received or if it is difficult to attach the probe to the infant, especially in the labor room when the baby is covered in amniotic fluid and burnings. After the initial stabilization, we usually use the servo mode. Here, we have to set the required infant temperature, usually at 36.5 degrees and the radiant warmer will automatically adjust the heater output based on the measured temperature of the baby. So if the baby's temperature drops below the set temperature, it will increase the heater output and vice versa. In the delivery room or the newborn unit, switch on the radiant warmer at least 20 to 30 minutes before receiving the neonate. This is to make sure that the mattress and the sheets are pre-warmed before receiving the infant. We can initially set the warmer to manual mode and set the output at 100% for rapid pre-warming. Once the sheets are warm to touch, you can reduce the output to 50%. Once the infant is received in the warmer and the initial stabilization is complete, it is important to attach the temperature probe securely to the infant. This is especially important because we will be using the warmer in servo mode after the stabilization. If the probe comes loose while the baby is in servo mode, the measured temperature will fall and the radiant warmer will increase the heater output in response. This will result in overheating of the infant and hyperthermia. The skin temperature probe is attached to the right upper abdomen if the infant is supine or to the flanks or loins if the infant is prone. The probe should never be between the infant and the bed. If tegaderm or another transparent adhesive is available, Place it on the skin and place the probe on top of it to prevent skin injury. You have to use approximately 2 to 3 inches of adhesive tape to secure the probe. Approximately 1 inch of the tape is left in front of the sensor and 1 inch as the split tails. Splitting 1 end of the tape into 1 inch tails as shown in this video will prevent the tape from lifting when the probe wire moves. You may have to use a slightly smaller length of tape for smaller infants. A cap can be used to cover the head of the infant under the warmer and socks and mittens can be used to cover the hands and feet. Stable babies under the radiant warmer can be clothed with the skin probe securely attached. Sick babies who need closer monitoring are not clothed but the head and extremities can still be covered. Plastic wrap can be applied to the radiant warmer as shown. Applying plastic wrap to the bassinet will help protect the infant from heat loss. Although heating the infant is the main function of the warmer, modern warmers may have other functions as well. You may be able to tilt the bed, place an x-ray plate under the infant without disturbing the infant, or adjust the height of the bed during procedures. There may be an examination lamp or integrated equipment for CPAP or pulse oximetry. If the baby's temperature is high, check to make sure that the skin probe is correctly placed if the warmer is being used in servo mode. If the warmer is in manual mode, the heater output may have been set at an inappropriately high level or if the heater output is low, the baby might be having fever. In any case, whenever the display temperature of the infant is abnormal, it is also important to check the axillary temperature. If the infant's temperature is low, check to make sure that the radiant farmer is working and the display shows heater output. If there is no heater output, maybe the heater lamp needs to be changed. If the warmer is working correctly and the set temperature is correct and the infant's temperature is still low, check to see if there is a draft of cold air from a window or air conditioning vent where the warmer is placed. In case of a power failure alarm, check if the machine is plugged in correctly and if the fuse is intact. Okay, 
so we saw how the radiant warmer is used for uh, treating hypothermia initially if it is moderate to severe hypothermia we have to do rapid warming by putting heater output uh, 100% once the temperature reaches up to 34 degree centigrade then we can uh, make it slow warming so that our target of heat and temperature rise should not be more than 0.5 degree per hour okay so uh, next uh, next pentagon of assessment is uh, airway and breathing i have combined them both in a single heading so emergency signs would be any child who is having gasping apnea or not breathing central cyanosis severe respiratory distress with chest in drawing apnea spells or grunting so in all those cases we have to manage airway accordingly now whenever we are managing airway we have to look for whether it is open or closed whether it is obstructed any strider is audible or not and generally for new units uh, best way to make airline or airways open is to make slight neck should be slightly extended position which is known as stepping dog position how we achieve it we generally put a gauze piece around 3 uh, 2 by 3 matlab around 1 inch 1 and 1/2 inch depth gauze piece around the shoulder so neck becomes slightly extended and the airway has become patent and any secretions we have to clear it with use of a suction catheter and in case of gasping apnea we have to follow nrp guidelines i am uh, not going to di discuss in detail of nrp guidelines so you all know the indication for using uh, giving positive pressure ventilation as per nrp guideline if a child there is apnea there is a shallow breathing or gasping and heart rate is falling less than 100 we have to initiate positive pressure ventilation if it is a term baby we can start with room air if it is pre term baby we can start somewhere between 21 to 30% and after heart rate improves still the grunting uh, retractions and cyanosis is persisting then we can definitely consider Uh, using cpap subsequently and we know once the temperature is not if that there is hypothermia that can exaggerate pulmonary hypertension and that can lead to cyanosis and uh, severe respiratory um, hypoxemia that is why it is always important when, even if we are managing airway and breathing we have to manage we have to maintain normal temperature and some priority signs non uh, non emergency signs are respiration rate which is more than uh, 60 but there is no associated chest in drawing or grunting in that case most common causes is uh, we have to uh, detail we have to do detail assessment we have to rule out nasal block because if, if there is nasal block also there will be some uh, there will be some noisy breathing child will be in distress and then we have to work up for common bacterial and viral causes of pneumonia and we have to manage accordingly so how respiratory distress and severity is assessed in newborn there are lot of re respiratory distress scoring system two commonly used scoring system is silverman anderson scoring system another is downey scoring downey scoring is preferably used for term babies while silverman anderson scoring is useful for both term and preterm babies depending your expertization and when whichever scoring you are comfortable you should use it so here for all our uh, for all our attendees i am showing you the uh, silverman anderson score dear abolly please play silverman anderson score uh, one video so sure, ma'am In this video the newborn has an audible grunt giving a score of 2 nasal flaring is visible from a distance giving a score of 2 there is seesaw upper chest movement giving a score of 2 there are some zipoid recessions giving a score of 1 and some lower chest recessions giving a score of 1 so the total silverman anderson score in this infant is 8 can you play the second one also second video also yes ma'am 
In this newborn on CPAP, there is an abdominal lag on the upper chest giving a score of 1. There are some xiphoid recessions giving a score of 1. There is no visible nasal flaring even seen from a close view giving a score of 0 and there is no audible grunt or there is no grunt audible on auscultation again giving a score of 0. There are no lower chest attractions giving a score of 0. So the total SA score or the Silverman Anderson score in this infant is 2. If you can show the third video, this is just for just how a term baby is presenting just after delivery. You can see audible grunt is there, then lower chest retractions 1 and deferred retraction is 1 and we can see uh, seesaw breathing is there. So, uh, uh, there is no grunting, uh, grunting is there. So, the score is 6, 5 to 6 the score. Okay, next, stop. So this is the photograph showing how we are managing airways in emergency. We have to uh, put a gauge piece. Uh, we have to make a shoulder roll in that. Or if the shoulder roll gauge piece is not available, we can use any soft cloth to make a roll or thin layer pillow like structure, which uh, we have to give, uh, which, have, which, have, which we have to put under shoulder. So that neck is, bec uh, neck is becoming slightly extended. Then you have to use a positive pressure ventilation. So these are the pro equipments which should be ready in the triaging area for giving positive pressure ventilation. Uh, one of the, ideally one of the three can give positive pressure ventilation. Most commonly used is um, bag and mask ventilation. Other two is anesthetic, anesthesia bag or known as flow inflating bag. Third one is TP resuscitator. Whatever equipment is available, we should be confident in using one of the equipment. And uh, common source of giving oxygen without any positive pressure ventilation, only whenever when the baby requires only oxygen. So two common methods of giving oxygen without positive pressure ventilation, which is used in newborn, is nasal prong oxygen and food box oxygen. In nasal prong oxygen, usually the flow is uh, 0.5 to 1 liter and the common FiO2, final FiO2 delivered, it depends on the many factors, usually it is less than 40 percent. While in food box oxygen, uh, the flow set, oxygen flow set is min more than 2 liters, usually 2 to 5 liters and depending on whether one port or two port is open, we can achieve a FiO2, final FiO2 concentration varying from 60 to 90 percent in a hood box. Recently, hood box is not used so frequently. So third, uh, th fourth uh, pillar of management is uh, your circulatory parameters. Some emergency signs in circulation are cold extremities with CFT more than three seconds, weak and fast pulse, heart rate of more than 160. That indicates that child is in shock. So our management would be whenever a child is have, when a newborn is coming to casualty in shock, we have to give supplementary oxygen, maintain normal temperature. We have to immediately put IV access. If it is a, a preterm newborn and just after delivery, we can put UVC very easily. And beyond that, we have to give, uh, we have to in, insert a IV cannula, a peripheral line or intraosseous line and give normal saline bolus uh, at the rate of 10 ml per kg over 30 minutes. And then subsequently we have to evaluate the cause of shock. It can be cardiogenic shock, it can be septic shock or it, it is because of obstructive, uh, obstructive causes like tension pneumothorax and then we have to, our treatment should be uh, 
uh, our treatment should be uh, modified accordingly. So these are some videos uh, how uh, generally we check CFT. So you have this video? Yes, ma'am. Uh, please play from my side. CFT. Whenever we are checking CFT, usually we put our finger over the sternum or on the forehead for One, five seconds. Two, three, four, five, thousand one, thousand two, thousand. So play it again. One, two, three, four, five, thousand one, thousand two, thousand. So generally, whenever we are checking CFT, we have to press the skin above uh, forehead or sternum for five seconds the main purpose is to blanch the skin and uh, make it white so that all blood vessels are getting blanched then we have to remove we have to withdraw our finger and count as thousand one thousand two thousand six thousand three so each uh, counting will which will be uh, of one second so usually then CFT is less than two seconds. If it is more than three seconds, then it indicates child is in shock. Next, how we are inserting UVC uh, line and peripheral at venous line while managing circulatory failure. Please show those videos. video we shall learn about the use of volume expanders at the time of resuscitation. Normal saline is used during resuscitation if there is a history of blood loss at birth or there is no response to steps of resuscitation or there are signs of poor perfusion like poor pulses or tachycardia. Ensure that Normal saline is there in a pre-filled 20 ml syringe. This should be replaced daily. The dose of normal saline is 10 ml per kg. That means if a newborn weighs 1.2 kg at birth, the amount of normal saline required is 12 ml. Attach the syringe to the intravenous axis and push over the next 5 to 10 minutes. The bolus may have to be repeated if these signs persist. A maximum of two doses of normal saline bolus may be given. Remember, there is no role of fresh frozen plasma or albumin as a volume expander during neonatal resuscitation. Thank you. Next video, please. This video shows you an intravenous cannula insertion and fixation. Venous access is required for the administration of fluids, medications and blood products. For establishing a venous access, we need sterile gloves, spirit and povidon iodine swabs, sterile 24 or 26 gauge cannula, 1 ml syringe, normal saline, tape and scissors and tigerdum, a splint is optional. Intravenous access can be established at the following sites. Veins on the dorsum of the hand, antecubital vein, scalp veins or ankle veins. Follow aseptic precautions while establishing intravenous access. Wash your hands. Prepare the infant for the procedure considering developmentally supportive care. Swaddle the infant and allow the infant to suck on his finger. Have a second person hold the infant to minimize stress. Put on gloves. To insert the cannula, hold the extremity and make the vein prominent. Clean the area with spirit and wait until it becomes dry. Remember, do not blow air over the site. Now cleanse with povidone iodine swab 
and let it dry. Then clean again with spirit swab. Insert the cannula gently with the bevel of the needle facing up. Introduce the needle at a 30 degree angle approximately 0.5 cm below the desired entry point into the vein. Advance the needle slowly towards the vein until it is felt to pierce the vessel wall. A slight pop may be felt. Check if it is in the vein. Blood will appear in the hub if the cannula is in the proper place. When blood appears, flush the cannula with 0.1 or 0.2 ml of normal saline to check for patency. Observe if there is any extravasation. Secure the cannula first by fixing a transparent film, then by an adhesive tape. While fixing, make sure that the cannula tip area above the insertion is clearly visible. This will help in early detection of extravasation. If necessary, use a splint to immobilize the joint. Now the IV cannula is fixed on the baby. Remove gloves and wash your hands. Okay, so we saw how a cannula has to be put and then IV fluid has to be connected in that. So these are the skills related to management of circulatory shock parameters. The, la the last parameter of the pentagon is coma or con uh, sorry, fourth parameter is coma or convulsion. In emergency sign, its neonate can present always with a uh, convulsing or coma or uh, subtle seizures. Then our management should be uh, managing the airways and checking blood sugar because hypoglycemia is one of the common cause for uh, seizure in neonates. And if there is a hypoglycemia and it is causing, it is symptomatic in form of the convulsion, then we have to treat. Usually it is treated with 2 ml per kg, 10% dextrose bolus, followed by glucose infusion rate, infusion rate of 6 mg per kg per minute. So 6 m microgram per kg per minute. So we have to start infusion. Uh, with that, uh, next, uh, after that, after 30 minutes of starting IV fluid, we have to recheck again blood sugar and it has to be, it has to be normalized. By normalization, we mean blood sugar values should be more than 50 mg per deciliter. If after 30 minutes also blood sugar is still remaining low, we have to gradually hike the GIR by 2 mg per kg per minute. So if the baby is, uh, despite treating hypoglycemia, baby is still having convulsion, then we have to uh, empirically consider treating hypocalcemia. If your institute or your, there is facility for monitoring ionized calcium, then you have to take sample of for monitoring ionized calcium. And But don't wait till the report comes. You can always start treating empirically with calcium. So if uh, calcium, uh, we have to again give bolus 2 ml per kg calcium gluconate. Once the, uh, subsequently, we have to give uh, maintenance calcium, we have to add 80 mg per kg in the normal 24 hours IV fluid. And when we are giving bolus over 20 minutes, it has, it has to be remembered that calcium can cause cardiostimulatory action. It has cardiostimulatory properties. So always calcium infusion has to be given under cardiac monitoring. I, ideally, in the, uh, you have to attach the child with an ECG monitor. If still child is having convulsion, then we have to give anticonvulsants. The no, most commonly used anticonvulsants in neonates is phenobarbital, which is given uh, with a loading dose of 20 mg per kg per 20 mg. Uh, it has to be given over uh, one hour. Subsequently, maintenance dose has to be started with 3 to 5 mg per kg. If still convulsion is present, then we can consider giving mini loading. Nowadays, people are uh, preferring more levetiracetam because it, it's a uh, safety profile and availability, uh, availability for profile. So this is one video. Uh, I will show uh, how the seizure is happening in a child who is, this child is actually admitted in our ICU. He was having seizure. So this can happen to a child who is coming from home and presenting in your casualty also.
so please share this video miss yes, abodi please play yes ma'am can see this child is having the type of movements in hands okay you can stop now the last point of management is uh, dehydration the features will be lethargy sunken eyes and very low skin pinch in that we have to take uh, we have to maintain again temperature insert iv line the skills i have already shown start iv fluid rapidly as per the plan c so dehydration how to manage severe dehydration i am not covering in this point so with this i will stop my talk uh, hopefully i am able to clear your doubts thank you uh thank you so much ma'am first of all for accepting our invitation and then delivering such an important and such an interesting session i uh, i know and i'm sure everyone present here would agree to that so now moving forward